The Bard Music Festival is unusual, if not unique, in part because it does something different from most festivals. Most festivals uh, try, in a good way, to cater to the public by providing things they know the public will like and will enjoy. The Bard Music Festival tries something a little different. It starts where the audience is. That is, an audience that wants to know something about music, or that likes going to concerts, that is actually um, looking forward to spending part of the summer in, uh, in, in the concert hall. And, uh, but what's interesting about the Bard Music Festival is that it tries to expand the horizons of the audience and also make it possible for new audiences to go to concerts for the first time, perhaps. Younger audiences or audiences interested in other things, and not necessarily music. So the festival is organized in such a way uh, to make the music part of a larger fabric. So this summer, uh, the subject is, in a word, 19th and early 20th century France. So if people are interested in French painting, or they're interested in Proust and French literature, French culture, or Paris, uh, this is the place to be, because one gets a kind of very uh, well-organized and exciting glimpse of French culture, French taste, uh, the nature of the French Empire, French politics, uh, things that actually will help people understand France today. So music becomes not a decorative medium on the side, a special thing, but a central part of the fabric of life and culture. The figure Camille Saint-Saëns, the composer, uh, is unusual uh, because, first of all, he lived a very long time. So he was born in the 1830s and died in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, his life spans the transformation of France uh, from the period immediately after Napoleon uh, to the years after the First World War, from a period of neoclassicism and the birth of French opera to uh, modernism, uh, to the world of Picasso and Stravinsky, uh, from the world of Berlioz and the world of Delacroix and Ingres. And so it is a kind of a very compact and exciting travel through time, uh, through most of the 19th century. Camille Saint-Saëns himself uh, is famous uh, for probably one piece, which is the Swan, which everybody knows from the Carnival of the Animals. Ironically, something he never published in his lifetime and written very late in his career. But he also was among the most celebrated and most famous musicians of his era. Uh, amazingly, you know, he got an honorary degree at Oxford. He visited the United States, I think, twice. He traveled the world over. He was a real fantastic piano virtuoso. Uh, he was a prodigy, so as a young man, even a boy, he became famous. We were going to do a symphony he wrote when he was 15 years of age. And uh, so he entered the public arena uh, already very early and uh, was lionized by Parisian audiences, and then became famous all over Europe. He was uh, very much admired by Liszt, who became a patron of his. And he developed a kind of household reputation because he wrote for all kinds of publics. The 19th century was a period in the history of music uh, where amateurism was a growing phenomenon. People increasingly bought pianos. The piano became the computer of the 19th century. Everybody had to have one. And uh, so he understood that part of the audience, so he wrote a lot of music for home use, piano transcriptions, he tried to find a way to teach a new public in the 19th century about the history of music. He made arrangements of lots of music from the past. Uh, he wrote things for students and for real amateurs. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, he sought to have real fame and success in the most prestigious, if you will, of uh, French musical forms, which was the opera, both the comic opera and the grand dramatic opera. And he wrote many operas, only one of which 
has ever really been successful, called Samson and Delilah, which ironically was premiered by Liszt in Weimar in Germany and not in France. He had a hard time making it on the opera stage. The only other opera outside of Samson and Delilah that ever really has attracted a lot of attention is an opera with which we're closing the festival in a semi-stage version on the uh, loves of Henry VIII. It's an opera which really focuses on Henry VIII's relationship to Anne Boleyn and to his wife, Catherine. And so it's a love triangle, quadrangle, if you will, and also it is, um, it's a remarkably um, uh, dramatic and colorful opera. Sanson took care when he went to England to find music from the period. He was very interested in the history of music. So he looked at Elizabethan and pre-Elizabethan uh, songbooks to try to get what he thought were authentic materials to incorporate in the opera. Sanson also was all his life a fantastic performer, so also doing uh, one of the great piano concertos, the Egyptian piano concerto. And then we're doing some choral music because he was, uh, like all French composers, uh, very uh, adept at writing religious music, uh, both uh, for choruses and for the organ. There's a special organ recital as well. He was an organist of the uh, church on the Madeleine and uh, very well admired for an as an improviser and as a um, writer for the organ. And he wrote a great deal of chamber music and was particularly interested in uh, developing a style which was self-consciously eclectic. He was a believer that music had developed uh, into a, an art form that had real rules and real distinctions between beauty and ugliness. And although he absorbed new trends, uh, Wagnerian trends, and especially Listian ideas about how music can relate to telling a story and how to structure a piece just with one theme, so he had uh, what we would call modern ideas for the time, he was very much rooted in the traditions of Mozart and Beethoven. And as time went on, and there was more innovation in the late 19th century, he became a really curmudgeonly conservative, which is very interesting. He uh, was one of the many people who, as they get older, looks at the past as a kind of lost great moment and looks at the present and all things that are modern as a reflection of a decline in culture. We're very familiar with this argument. It happens in Saint-Saëns' case not really to be true, but he was very suspicious of Debussy and uh, horrified uh, by the premiere of The Rite of Spring in 1913 and of the young Stravinsky. So he became a fighter on behalf of musical standards of beauty and form. Yet at the same time, his late work, some of which we're doing, uh, shows uh, that he was listening and that he didn't quite ever repeat himself. There's a great adage that um, if you don't know what a piece of music, who the composer is, if you hear it, but it's beautifully written, it must be by Saint-Saëns because his craft was absolutely flawless. He's one of these composers who absolutely breathed music and thought music and he wanted to please the public. So there isn't a single piece by Saint-Saëns that isn't a delight to listen to and actually inspiring. And the interesting thing about using Saint-Saëns as a subject for this year's festival is that in past years, we've always taken somebody uh, about whom there are real enthusiasts. In the case of Saint-Saëns, he's a forgotten great man. And we always love underdogs. You know, we always uh, tend to uh, celebrate people who are famous, about whom there's no argument. Who can quarrel with Beethoven? Who can quarrel with Debussy? Who can quarrel with Bartok? You know, we're surrounded by people who want to tell us the top ten composers in the world. Well, we're also interested in the possibility that after those proverbial top ten, uh, there are dozens of fantastic composers who are worthy of being listened to. In Saint-Saëns' case, he actually is a composer who's worthy to be listened to because he's consummately musical, has written an enormous amount of wonderful music, chamber music, piano music, choral music, that symphonies, concertos, that we don't hear. And we should hear them, because it reminds us, really, of a strange question. Why is it that we've forgotten about him? 
Why is it in the early 20th century that we took the height of cultivation and taste for beauty and a real ear for form and a real sense of music history and essentially threw it out with contempt? Saint-Saëns came to represent for the avant-garde, the angry young men and women of the 20s and 1930s. He epitomized a kind of middle-class conceit about culture about an audience who thought they knew what was beauty. But the reality is there's no reason to be angry at that audience. Now we have nostalgia for that audience. Uh, why make fun of people who love music and love the beauties of music and found it a consolation to sing his songs, to play his music, to listen to his concerts? Why have we turned our back on the very audience that actually um, has for generations sustained musical culture. So Saint-Saëns was on the side of the democratization of music, making a wider public uh, that really would fall in love with musical art as part of their lives. The modernists were snobs, and were angry snobs, and they somehow thought, well, that's being a Philistine. Well, he wasn't a Philistine, and his music was not second-rate, and he was a person a deep, intimate knowledge of the language of music and what was possible to do with music. So Saint-Saëns is a way of looking at our own conceits, our own anxieties about wanting to embrace the new, being nervous as we get older that we're out of touch, uh, people who uh, think that if they actually like something that seems overly sentimental perhaps or not complicated or not pretentiously profound, that we lack taste. In reality, Saint-Saëns thought music was a fantastically varied art and that his music could lend itself for all the things that we wish to see from music, which is a sense of beauty, of imagination, of intimacy, a tremendous sense of proportion and color and form. It's exciting music and wonderful music, also tinged very often with a sense of humor and a sense of irony. He was a great musician, great composer, uh, unfairly neglected in modern times. So in this festival, we will assemble 12, 13 concerts of all kinds of formats with mixed genres that cover his career and his contemporaries. Some well-known, like Debussy, some unknown, like Augusta Holmes, a woman composer, with whom Saint-Saëns, although probably a homosexual, had an infatuation, also became the girlfriend, if you will, of uh, César Franck, whose music is also represented. Another interesting question that's raised by Saint-Saëns is that he was very much committed to an international tradition of music. He was a nationalist. He was a real patriot. But his idea of patriotism was not necessarily in developing a distinctively French sound. He thought actually France was a place that could absorb and transform traditions, didn't have to invent one of its own completely. And perhaps the most modern thing about Saint-Saëns is that he was actually rare among composers in having a real interest in the world outside of the West. He was one of the first composers to take a real interest in Africa and in Asia. Now, clearly part of the French colonial sensibility. So his interests extended uh, to the range of the French Empire in Indochina and also in Africa. But he loved Algeria. He lived in Algiers. He actually died in North Africa. He used materials uh, from North Africa in his music. He really believed that the West needed to incorporate things from the East to keep its own culture alive, a very imperialist, if colonial, attitude, but one which served him very well. And so he was a real character. Uh, he was a world traveler in a time before world travel was commonplace. And like many composers, he was supremely articulate. Although he never really had a formal university education, he was an amateur scientist. He had his telescope. He was interested in mathematics. He wrote books one after another, of criticism on art, on music. Uh, he had his political views. He was a person 
who reminds us that being a musician is more than being just an entertainer. It also was an enormously important force in the development of French musical institutions, in concert societies, in its teaching institutions, and uh, played a, an unforgettable role, really, in the development of what we consider modern French culture. And he had his defenders, uh, composers. Gabriel Fauré, for example, was a protege of Saint-Saëns and never turned his back. Uh, Maurice Ravel uh, was a composer who uh, never belittled Saint-Saëns. And so here we have a chance to reclaim a man who in his lifetime uh, was a world-famous figure whose star has waned, if you will, or receded, and probably for the wrong reasons. And uh, so we're really thrilled by this summer. It will make a real contribution. And the entire festival is surrounded by a group of scholars who participated in creating another one of our Bard Festival series books by Princeton. For the last 23 years, we've published with each festival a book of essays and of documents that this series has become really a landmark series in the uh, development of awareness in music history. So with Princeton University Press, uh, we have been very proud to produce first-class volumes each year. This year, the volumes have been edited by Jan Passler. She's a leading expert in French music from the University of California. And it's a wonderful book of documents and essays uh, that will bring uh, new information and shed new light on Saint-Saëns. So it's an exciting festival of discoveries. Uh, there are a couple of familiar pieces, the organ symphony, Carnival of the Animals. But most of the music that people will hear will be very infectious but unknown.